Let's go to God in prayer, if you will. Most Heavenly Father, we're once again so thankful for this, again, another beautiful day that you are spared our lives. So thankful for your watch, care, and your protection over each one of us, and that you have allowed us the opportunity to be able to have worship and worship to thee. Father, we're so thankful for the many prayers that have been answered, for those that have been sick, that are doing better. And Father, we know that there are still many others that are out there in need of thy tender, loving care, and we pray over them. We pray especially for those that, that are infected with this virus, that you watch over them and help them to get back to a better portion of health. And Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones because of this virus. But Father, we pray especially right now at this point uh, to remember the Rutledge family and the loss of a loved one, Brother Glenn Rutledge, and to be with the family in this time of sorrow and to comfort them. Maybe they always look to thee and thy word for that comfort and strength to overcome. Father, we, we pray for our missionaries and the world over that are doing all that they can to spread the borders of thy kingdom, able to preach the gospel. I know with this virus that has gone on, it's been tough, but we know and we've heard of many good things that have happened even since then. Be with them as well. But Father, we pray for our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, those that care workers that are doing all they can to be with them that are in need. Help them to stay well, stay safe in every regard. Father, we pray for our military and what they're doing to keep us safe here in America as well. And those that might be infected, uh, you'll be with them as well. But Father, we're so thankful for your love and allowing us to worship thee. May we do all that we can to give you the glory and the praise and the honor that you deserve. Forgive us of our sins as we repent so our worship will not be hindered. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, please open them to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, that will be the scripture and the text for our lesson this morning. Luke chapter 14, we'll begin with verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. We're going to be looking at that particular scripture, if you still have that open. We're going to be talking specifically about how some folks seem to master the ability to make excuses for just about anything. I mean just about anything. I think about those who are trying to run businesses 
and their employees. And I think about all the employees that seem to come up with an excuse of why they can't do this or that. Or why are they late to work? Or why are they late from lunch? And, and so there are always some excuse they have created and, and come up with in this world of trying to really just come up with a way to say that they are doing what they're doing is okay. I've, I, I know of those that are, as, that are teachers out there in the world that as students, the students are always trying to make an excuse of why they can't do certain things. I know that those teachers have heard just about every excuse that is out there. I know of one that's probably the number one excuse of why a student cannot t- turn in their homework is because the dog ate it. Well, we know that in some cases that has been true, but in most cases it is not true, and it's just an excuse. And there are many other excuses why they can't turn in their term paper or, or a project that they were working on because it just wasn't enough time or some, some other excuse. But we understand they just seem to make excuses of whatever it might be every time. They have, we, we even find that in our spiritual realm as well when it comes to the church. There are people that will make an excuse of why they don't become a Christian. I find that interesting, you know, that they come up with different excuses. Well, if I, if I become a child of God, I, I might be condemning my parents who've already passed and gone on. And so it's just an excuse because they're living and they're having that opportunity and they should be doing all that they can to become a, a, a New Testament Christian. And so there's excuses. There are some that have excuses once they have obeyed the gospel and been maybe a Christian for some years, and they come up with an excuse why they can't do something that might have be related to work in the Lord's church. Why I can't do that and why I can't do this. And so we just come up with excuses. But I want you to notice me, with me here in Luke chapter 14, as we think about this idea of making excuses when it comes to the kingdom of God. I want to first begin by talking about the fact that there was an invitation that was sent out. That was sent out and how that might apply to us. Look at verse 16 of Luke 14 and notice Jesus said, A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at a supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. I want you to think with me about how that there is an invitation to salvation in his kingdom. You know, God is interested in your soul. God is interested in my soul. As a matter of fact, God is in the saving business, isn't he? God is interested in, our, in yours and mine's soul salvation. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost, Luke 19.10. The Bible also tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved, John 3, 16 and 17. And then I think about the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 when he said, God who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. You know, God is interested in every one of us and our souls. So much so that he sent his son to die for your sins and for mine. You know, those who come to Christ can expect, first of all, forgiveness from God. I mean, to know that we can be forgiven of every sin that we have committed. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1 and verse 7 that it is in Jesus that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. The Bible also tells us that the forgiveness that we enjoy is absolute that we do not have to experience the burden and the shame and the guilt of sin once we become a Christian. The Hebrew writer once said, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember 
no more, Hebrews 8 and verse 12. And so there is fellowship. You know, we think about the forgiveness from God, but then what about having fellowship with God? Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9, he says, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, when John wrote it in the latter part of the first century, in 1 John 1, 3, he said, they, he said, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, those of us who have obeyed the gospel... We have fellowship one with another, but we also have fellowship with God in heaven. But then I also think about the idea of having a future with God. To know that one day that we can be in eternity with Almighty God. We talk about God being in the saving business, but listen, God is interested. He's interested in every one of us and being with him in eternity in that place called heaven. Paul said that we live in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Titus 1 and verse 2. It was Peter who said that God has given unto us an inheritance, and he said that inheritance is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. And so first, there is the invitation to salvation in the kingdom. But then secondly, there is the invitation to service in the kingdom. Did you know that we have been saved to serve? Some might find that a little funny. Well, listen to what Paul said. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, you and I have been saved by the marvelous, matchless grace of Almighty God. And because of that grace and because of the blessings of redemption, we ought to have a desire to be active in his kingdom. You know, I think about what Titus well, what's written in Titus 2 and verse 7 when the Apostle Paul said that in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. In Titus 3 and verse 1 he said we are to be ready on that every good work. In verse 8 of that same book he said be careful to maintain good works. You see? So God is interested in us serving in his kingdom. You know, there are a lot of opportunities. You know, as I said earlier, that people try to make excuses why they can't be involved in the work in the kingdom. But there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, every one of us have different talents of what we could do that can be able to serve in the kingdom of our dear Lord. We have the opportunity to share the gospel with others. Well, it doesn't matter if it's family. <coughs> family or friends or or co-workers but we have those opportunities we need to do is share the gospel with them we have the opportunity to teach and to edify and to build up if you will one another in the body of Christ when there is that privilege that we have of being able to serve those who have the material needs but then what about the spiritual needs we need to help them as well in that area Also, Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse 2, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so, first of all, there were some invitations given. But then notice, secondly, according to Jesus, there were some excuses made. Back to our text, Luke 14, if you will. Listen to verse 18. Invitations have been sent out. And Jesus said, and they all with one consent began to what? Make excuse. That's right. First of all, consider with me the plausibility of those excuses. Notice the excuses that are given by those that had received an invitation. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs to go and see it. I pray thee, 
have me excuse. Isn't it true that sometimes we might buy something sight unseen? I, I've heard of people doing that. I, I might have done that on occasion. But here's a, here's a fellow who bought a piece of ground and wants to check it out. And I guess this was the only opportunity that he had to check it out. But notice another said, verse 19, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now when I think about those excuses that have been given, there are three specific excuses. They are conceivable. They're all logical to some extent. They might be credible. But I don't have any doubt about the legitimacy of these excuses. But the problem with them is that they were just that, excuses. What about the problem with excuses? When you think about the word excuse, what comes to your mind? Sometimes we use the word excuse to, to maybe justify our behavior, our actions. Sometimes we might use it in an attempt to, to, to negate some type of responsibility that we might have. Now, all of these guys had legitimate, bona fide excuses, if you will, at least in their mind. But yet they were just that. They were excuses. They always have an excuse for anything and everything. What about the excuses in the spiritual realm? I mean, this is where it kind of hits home, doesn't it, for us? What about when it comes to becoming a child of God? There are a number of people that have any number of excuses as to why they can't become a Christian. You know, as a preacher, I've heard just about every excuse that might be out there. Every so once in a while, I'll get one that just kind of throws me off, and I'm like, well, that's the first time I've ever heard that one. But I've heard them all. You know, one of the most prevalent excuses that I've heard used is the idea, I, I just don't know enough, right? Many of us have heard that on occasion, you know, I would become a Christian, but I just, I just don't know enough. Let me ask you this. When Paul wrote in Romans 6, uh, 3 and verse 23, when he said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, do, do you understand that statement? Let's read it again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's pretty good. I mean, you can't misunderstand that. I'm sure that all of us can understand that statement. But Paul said, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 and verse 10. And so based on that, well, based on that, we are sinners. And sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. And that means that every person that has reached the age of accountability is under sin. We also understand the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. That means that if you are outside of Christ, you are without hope and without God in the world, Ephesians 2 and verse 12. And so if that's the status of our situation, then here's what you need to do. Well, you, first, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then upon believing that, you need to repent of your sins. Well, are you willing to repent of your sins? That means to turn away from that which is wrong, to start doing that which is right. You know, Peter said on Pentecost Day to those present there in, in the city of Jerusalem, some of whom had had a part in the death of Jesus. He said in Acts 2.38, he told them to repent and be baptized. But repentance was very necessary to do what? It was a change of heart. It was a change of mind that followed by a change of actions and attitude. In other words, it is a change of life, right? In Acts 3 and verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore... And be ye converted. Do you understand that? Well, I hope that you do. And then the Bible talks about the eunuch in Acts 8 and verse 37. Who acknowledged that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. 
Would you be willing to confess that? That you believe? Do you believe? And then Peter said on Pentecost Day to those present, Acts 2.38, once again, to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, they needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Do you understand that? If you understand that, then you know enough. That's my point. You know enough to be baptized into Christ, to put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. You know enough to de- that God will then add you to the church, Acts 2.47. Now, why do, you, why do you need to be a member of the church? Because the Bible says Jesus is the Savior of the body. And so if you do believe those things, then you do know enough. You know enough to, to act on that and be saved. How much more do you need to know in order to become a child of God? Now, of course, we're going to continue teaching you after that where you need to be faithful. You need to be involved in the works of the church and so on and so forth. But if you know enough in order to become a child of God, a Christian, I think you know enough. And so it's just an excuse when you say you don't know enough. You know, I've heard some folks say that I would become a Christian, but you just don't understand my past. Oh, man, if you just understood what kind of person I was, you just don't realize how bad of a person I really have been. Well, maybe I just don't understand. Maybe, maybe I don't know how bad a person you are. Maybe I don't know how bad a person you think you are, but I do know this, that the Bible says that where sin abounds, grace abounds as well, right? I mean, that is very important. It abounds more, Romans 5.20. Have you ever committed murder? Have you ever taken the life of another person? You know, there are people in our world that have physically taken the life of another. But did you know they can be forgiven? That's true. They can be forgiven. How do I know that? Because the Apostle Paul was once a murderer. He was then a persecutor of the Lord's church. And it says here in 1 Timothy 1.14 that Paul said, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You go down to verse 15 there, and he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. He said, Paul was saying there, look, if you're a murderer, (laughs) I've been there, but I was forgiven. It might be that your life is marked by alcohol or drugs. It might be that you're a thief and that you have stolen in the past. Maybe you've engaged in sexual immorality, if you will. And in your mind, there's just no way God in heaven could ever forgive you. Well, listen to what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then he said in verse 11, And such were some of you. That's right. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If you have in your mind that you are just too bad a person to ever be saved, then what about the Corinthians that we just read about? What about the Apostle Paul that we just talked about? And then there are those who say, you know what? I would become a child of God. I would like to be a member of the church. But I see that there are just some folks that I know that attend there that they're hypocrites. They may say one thing and they do something completely different. Well, I understand that. I understand that there are hypocrites in the church or actually hypocrites in all aspects of our lives. But listen. 
when they step outside this world into that eternal realm, after having loved their life as a hypocrite, they will be judged accordingly as an individual for that. And it's not going to be pleasant. They will be lost and sent to a fiery hell. Jesus talked about the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, for they say and do not, Matthew 23, 3. But here's what he said in verse 33. He said, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the judgment of hell? That is Gehenna. The idea is that if someone is living the life of a hypocrite, if they are saying one thing but yet doing another, right? Their reward is coming. I would not let hypocrite, hypocrites keep me from obeying the gospel and being a member of the Lord's church. Because, see, they will be judged accordingly. I will be judged accordingly. And if I didn't become a member, I'd be just as bad as they are. I would be lost into an eternal fire. I want you to understand this, that the church is a hospital. That the church is intended to help sick people. And understand this, hypocrites are sick. They are sick. They need help. There is coming a day, though, and time when Jesus will separate the wheat from the chaff. Don't let hypocrisy keep you out of the church. Then there's some folks that use a number of excuses to keep them from being involved in the church. Have you ever heard somebody just say, you know, I'm just, I'm just too busy. I, I, I've got this going on. I've got, listen to me. We're all busy. We're all busy. I mean, if you live in this world, you're busy. I mean, I don't, I don't know of anybody that's not busy. You know, I've heard people tell me that when they retire from whatever profession, profession that they have been involved in, that in retirement, they have become more busy than they were when they were working five or six days a week. In fact, they've even said, how was it that I was able to get things done when I was working? Because I can't seem to get things done now that I'm retired. Well, that's a good thing, right? That means laziness hasn't been part of your, your, uh, part of your life. But I want you to understand this. We, we do what we want to do, don't we? The Bible tells us where to be involved in the kingdom of God. The Bible says that we have been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Paul said in Titus 2 and verse 14 that we're to be zealous of good works. We can say we are too busy, that we've got too much going on. But the bottom line is this. Maybe we need to build a bigger fire, don't we? We have to go to the ball games. We got time to do this. We got time to do that. We got time to work and all those other extracurricular activities. But we don't have the time to be involved in the work of the church that's for the Lord. And that's going to have eternal rewards. Hmm, maybe your priorities are in the wrong place. Sometimes we say, you know what? I have so much going on, schoolwork to do and other things that I don't have time for Wednesday night Bible study. Wait a minute. What is more important than learning about God? You know, our children got a lot of things that they have to do when it comes to school. But I've always wondered, how is it that that science experiment is going to get you to heaven? How is that math project going to help you get to heaven? You know, sometimes as parents, we excuse our children from coming to services because they just got so much homework to do, so much schoolwork. That message we're telling our children is that schoolwork is more important than God. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That means before anything else, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33. Well, somebody says, well, that sounds awfully tough. Yes, it is tough, all right. But that is exactly what the Son of God said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
That's not my interpretation of what Jesus said. It's called a quotation of what Jesus said. Is Jesus first in your life? You know, in our text of Luke 14, Jesus said, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. What is your excuse? You know, you can come up with 100 reasons why you can't do this or do that in the kingdom of God. The question to be asked is, are they valid? Are they valid? Are they valid in the eyes of God? Sometimes we say, well, I just don't have enough ability. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the body and how every part of that human body has a function. Well, the the same is true when it comes to the church. Every part of the body, the church, has a function. I, I want you to understand, you have an ability. Now, maybe you don't have the ability to lead singing or to preach or to teach a class or whatever, but you have the ability to take out a card and write a, a, a comforting word to the, to the loved ones who just had a, a, a family member that died. You have an opportunity to pull out a card. It, just, just, it might be a birthday card to send to somebody who just had a birthday or was going to have a birthday. You have the opportunity. They're, they're there. You can do something which is better than nothing. But you can do that. That's an ability. You have the ability to pick up the telephone and just call somebody and say, you know what? We missed you. We missed you. You have the ability over the course of seven days to use a telephone where you can call somebody that's in the church and just pick them up. Even if it was just a call them and tell them a joke that you heard. Put a smile on their face. You see, you have an ability. You might be the very person to reach the individual who's been missing services for some time. And you might be just the one that would say, you know what, I need to be back. I need to be back right with the Lord. And so we find that there are others out there in the world that come up with the excuse that, well, you know, we'll just let somebody else do it. Let the preacher do it. Let the elders do it. Let the deacons do it. Why not let you do it? What's wrong with you? You can do it. Why can't you do it? And so excuses are just that. They are excuses. But then thirdly, there are some exclusions. Listen now to what Jesus said, beginning in verse 21 of Luke 14. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go ye out into the highways and the edges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Think with me about the will of the Lord. First, I want you to see that there are occupancies in the Lord's house. Verse 22, Jesus said, and yet there is room. There is a place for you in the kingdom of God. Did you know that? You see, the kingdom will never get to a point where God says, wait a minute. We filled our quota. You know, it's full. We don't need anybody else. That's not the case. There's always room for another person. And there's room for you. Do you believe that? And then there's the objective. Verse 23, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. You you see, God is interested in a full house, isn't he? That, That is, he's interested in the kingdom being full of souls. What what does that say about you? What does it say about the, the worth of the human soul? Did you know that Jesus went to the cross for you? That he thought enough about you to go to the cross and die for you? I mean, if you had been the only person on this earth that needed a Savior, the Son of God would have gone to the cross and died for you only, personally. Jesus is interested in his house being full 
The kingdom of God needs to be full of precious soul. Then I want you to hear the word of the Lord. Look at verse 24. Jesus said, For I say unto you, that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Here it is. If you have an excuse of for why you cannot become a Christian, if you have an excuse of why you can't serve in the kingdom of God, God says, come. You say no. God says to do this. You say no, I can't. I've got other things to do. Listen, on judgment day, there will not be any excuses. Oh, you, you might be trying to squeeze in one. But the Lord's going to say, whoa, wait a minute. That's not going to work here. You might have been able to fool your boss. You might have been able to fool your teacher. You might have been able to fool uh, your fellow man, fool them. But you're not going to fool me, God says. Since you said no to me, and every time that I asked you to do something, now is my opportunity to say no to you. Listen to what Matthew writes. Jesus talking. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, for many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful words? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can knock all you want. You can beg, you can plead, you can cry, you can do whatever you want to do. Here's the answer. No. No. You're not coming in. I don't want to hear that. I don't think you do either. Right now, you have the opportunity to obey the gospel. I mean, I know that times with this war on this virus kind of makes things a little bit difficult, but it's not really that difficult because if you want to obey the gospel and you know enough, because you do, we, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. Don't let this virus keep you from obeying the gospel. Don't let that be your excuse. No. The devil wants you to do what you want to do as long as it does not involve God. How many folks will stand before God and say, you know, I had every intention of obeying the gospel. I have every intention of living a faithful life, but I never did. But God's going to say, no, it's too late now. Don't stand there while being judged to give another excuse. And let me tell you now, while you're still breathing, I want, I want to plead with you now today to get rid of whatever excuse that, that is standing between you and the Lord and make things right. I'm telling you, there's coming a day when that opportunity will be gone forevermore. There are no second chances so whatever your state may be, you know what the Bible says to become a Christian. You know what the, the, the Bible says about you being faithful as a child of God once you became that Christian. But it's up to you to make that decision to make things right. You can write us. You can call us. Whatever. Let's, let's get things right. Tomorrow may be too late.